Genesis 22, verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Verse 19, So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, uh, Melka, uh, uh, Melka, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor. Huz, or we pronounce it Uz, his firstborn, and Buzz, his brother. And they had another brother named Cuz. No, I'm just kidding. It's not in there. Huz, Buzz, and Cuz. Amen. No, that's, that's just, they, they weren't triplets. They, they were just brothers here. And then it says that, verse 21, there was also the third child was uh, Kimiel. Uh, you pronounce that with K-E-M slash U-E-L. Uh, U-E-L. Kimiel, the father of Aram. And Kizid, Kizid that's pronounced K-E slash S-E-D. I wanted to say cheese, but uh, it wasn't correct. So, uh. And then there's Hazo. That's H A slash Z O H Z O and Pill Dash Pill Dash P I L Dash D A S H Dash and Jadith and Bethel and Bethel begat Rebecca. I don't know why she had such a simple, easy name. Do you? All her brothers, or all her, uh, all her uncles there uh, had crazy names, but she takes a simple name. She. Bethel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Ramah. She also, uh, she bare also Teba, and Gaham, and Tash, and Machaz. Verse 20, uh, chapter 23, verse 1, And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjaharibah, the same as Hebron. I like Hebron better, don't you? In the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Eth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Amen. And the children of Eth answered Abraham. Some call it Heath or Eth. I, I pronounce it with the H silent. Saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord. Thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Eth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephraim the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Malpaliah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a bearing place amongst you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that in Jesus' name that you would be honored by us being here tonight. I thank you for those that are here tonight, our Lord, to be a servant, Lord, whether their uh, Lord came to prepare the auditorium, Lord, uh, for our study, or whether they came to prepare the sermon audio tonight for others to participate, enjoy, if there be those that are helping with our children, our teens, 
Uh, Lord, we sure do thank you for these servants. We thank you for these that are faithful, Lord, tonight. Uh, Lord, thank you, Lord, that uh, Satan did not allow, uh, or they didn't allow Satan, Lord, to use the weather or anything, being wore out or tired, Lord, to keep them from the house of God. Lord, I, I, I guess that if I only came when I felt good, I'd hardly ever come to church, Lord. So, Lord, but we know that you had a body like we did. And Lord, the book of Matthew says that in, in the most distressing time of your life, uh, Lord, you went a little farther. And Lord, help us that we'll go a little farther with you and for you. Lord, our flesh is weak. Lord, we are told by the Apostle Paul is inspired by God to say, put no confidence in our flesh. So we ask you tonight that you would help us and honor us by, Lord, touching our hearts. May every mind be ready, hearts receptive to what we have tonight. May I be a blessing. May I help, Lord, these that are here and those that will be listening for the days to come. Those that are sick, Lord, we beg that you would touch them. Those that are away, the side of town are working, we pray you'll touch them. Now, Lord, we especially ask you to touch those that, Lord, they're away from God, and that's why they're away from church tonight. I pray you'll work in their heart, Lord. Touch them and do a work, Lord. Lord, and we'll ask you in all these things in the name that's above every name, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Now, hopefully you do remember our study last Wednesday evening. Very emotional study for me as God impressed upon my heart uh, how Abraham, a father, what he must have been through, what he, how he must have felt to go about Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son, in a burnt offering. I thank the Lord that God the Father sacrificed His Son for us. We finish in verse 13 and verse 14 where the Bible tells us about how God spared not only Isaac, but He spared Abraham from harming Isaac. And we see that God had provided a lamb, as Abraham had said he would. And the Bible says that this ram was behind Abraham, and I brought out how that being behind Abraham gives us a picture of how the sacrifice of the precious lamb of God would come after the days of Abraham and even Isaac and so forth, and how our Lord would die on Golgotha's brow, at Calvary. And we talked about how that this Mount Moriah was actually the place in the book of Samuel that the Bible shares with us that David, King David, had sinned by numbering the people. And the Bible says because of that, I believe 70,000 Jews, 70,000 of David's people that he loved and ruled over, uh, died because of a plague. And David bought a threshing floor, and from that threshing floor made a sacrifice, built an altar, and God stayed the plague. I believe the word is stayed the plague. And no one else died. Well, years later, we know that Solomon uh, built his temple, uh, Solomon's temple, for his God. It really wasn't Solomon's temple. It was God's temple. But he built it there on that same site of the threshing floor that David had bought. And now today, this site, Mount Moriah, the same site that Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, the same site that Abraham sacrificed this ram, the same site that David bought the threshing floor and sacrificed unto God, and because of that, God stayed the plague, the same site that Solomon built the temple to God well, is the same site today where it is called the Dome of the Rock where the Muslims have the Golden Dome. If you ever look at pictures of Jerusalem, uh, you would see the Golden Dome building there. And Calvary was not at that spot, but Calvary was not far from that spot. 
And we looked at how that this ram was caught in a thicket. Verse number 14, the Bible said there that, uh, uh, or verse 13, excuse me, it said that behind him a ram was caught in a thicket by his horns. And, and I brought out how that I felt the Lord had impressed my heart and had thrilled my heart by the uh, prophetic picture that he gives us there of the death of Christ and how that the ram, of course, being a, uh, a, a strong, a powerful animal, and having horns shows the authority. And, of course, our Lord uh, was given all power by his Father. And how that this ram's horns was caught in a thicket, and how that a thicket was there because of the curse of the ground. And because of the ground being cursed was, we know, because of the sin in the Garden of Eden. Our Lord died and was a sacrifice. He gave up all His power. He could have called legions of angels. He could have spoke the Word and all those Roman soldiers, all those chief priests, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, Herodians, whoever it was, He could have spoke the Word and it all dropped dead. But He set aside His power, His glory, that He might sacrificially give His life because of the curse of sin. So what a beautiful picture that is. This ram never fought against Abraham that we know of. There's no record of it. I believe it shows us how our Lord was willing to give His life for you and I. We never read about our Lord fussing and fighting and trying to get away from His accusers. The Bible says the book of Isaiah that He was as a lamb led to the slaughter, but he spoke not a word. Bible says there that he took the ram. I, I love this. He took the ram, and that word took is a simple word, but it needs to be understood, or the definition does. It, it's a picture of someone giving something to someone else. Uh, as if uh, I asked Brother... Alan for a peppermint. Brother Alan digs in his pocket. He holds the peppermint in his hand. And I took or I take the peppermint. Uh, I didn't have to take it by fighting Brother Alan. Brother Alan was willing to give it to me. And I believe that just that word took in verse number 14 also is a prophetic statement or a picture of of how our Lord was willing to lay His life down. No one took His life. Are you with me tonight? He willingly gave it. Took means a picture of someone giving something to another. He gave us His life so that we might have life. God delivered up His Son for us all, and He was obedient unto death. And then I love the last part of verse 14, uh, 13. The Bible says that he offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. I'm glad for that. Thank God that he took our place on Calvary. He said, well, preacher, I wasn't around them days of Calvary. I know, but when I say at Calvary, I'm simply saying he took our sin debt. He paid a bill that we owed. Amen? He paid a bill that we owed. Now, the Bible says in verse 14 that Abraham uh, called this the Mount of the Lord, which is simply Zion. And we know that when we speak of Zion's hill or the city of Zion, the city of God, the city of David, we're talking about Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem here is where this sacrifice was going to be made. But years later, it would be the place also of the greatest sacrifice ever known to mankind when Jesus gave his life. Now let's go to verse number 15. Verse 15. And the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. I want us to think about those words, the second time. We know that God has spoke to Abraham before he made the journey up Mount Moriah with Isaac. And then 
this story shares with us the time that the Lord spoke to Abraham in verse number 11. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. That's the first time. Now this is the second time that the angel of God has spoken or going to speak to Abraham. Now notice that the second time that Abraham is spoken to by God came after the burnt sacrifice of the ram. Very important. It is in, you know, verse 13, we just looked at it. Abraham offered uh, him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. It was after Abraham, after he gave the burnt sacrifice of the ram to God, that God spoke to Abraham again, or the second time. Now, this realm, I'd like to say this before I continue, this realm uh, and his death reminds us, or is a picture of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. I want to see if you can uh, see this tonight. First of all, when we look at the realm's death, and we look at our Lord's death, first of all, they both were a sacrifice. The word sacrifice is very important to understand if you're really going to get the full, full joy of what I'm trying to share with you tonight. You need to understand the word sacrifice. It means to the surrender or destruction of something valued for the sake of something else. That is wonderful. A sacrifice is the surrender or the destruction of something valued for the sake of something else. For the sake of something else. The Bible teaches us here that this realm was a sacrifice. This realm took the place of Isaac. Our Lord took our place. Amen. And I will say that the word sacrifice means the destruction of something valuable in the place of something. That's The one that's valuable is the Lord and the ones that were invaluable is us. Amen. You might as well amen that tonight. You might as well amen. The valuable one the precious one, was destroyed. He was slain on a cross for you and I that our grandma would say is not worth the salt and our bread. I tell you what, amen? It was a sacrifice. Number two, the death of this ram reminds us of the death of our Lord because it was not only a sacrifice, but it was a substitute. Substitute. Instead of Isaac, God allowed this ram to be a substitute. Instead of you and I burning in hell forever, God allowed His Son to be a substitute. Amen? Number three, it was willing. This ram was willing. You say, well, preacher, it being an animal, I'm sure that it fought. I don't know about that. I believe God has control over animals too. Ask them lions that was in the den of lions. God controlled them. Ask that whale. Well, the Bible says big fish. That's what Jonah said, but Jesus said it was a whale. Ask that whale. That whale, God had control over that whale, didn't he? Amen. We can go on and on. How about that donkey? Amen. Sometimes you think... They're dumb as a donkey. God can still use them too, amen. Aren't you glad? That's why I'm standing up here tonight, amen. God can use donkeys, amen. And uh, he was willing. I believe God had complete control over that ram, and that ram was willing. So was our Lord willing, amen. Fourth of all, it was a bloody sacrifice. A bloody sacrifice. If you study how a burnt sacrifice is to be done, you would understand that the throat of an animal was to be sliced. That's how an animal was to die and was to bleed. 
a bloody sacrifice. If you were there before this ram was totally consumed by the fire, you would see blood on the hands and maybe on the garments of Abraham. You would see blood all over this ram. You see blood all over the altar. You see blood all over the ground. You might even see blood had squirted over there on the side of a tree or a limb or some leaves. Preacher, that's gory. It wasn't as gory as it was the day our Lord was on the cross. You say, preacher, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't like a bloody religion. Well, then you can't be born again. Salvation is a bloody religion. It's all because of the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. I can just imagine how bloody and gory this scene was. But I can't even imagine how bloody and gory the scene was at Calvary. When the Bible says that you and I would not even recognize Jesus as a man. Oh my. Then I'll say, fifth of all, it was a total sacrifice. A total sacrifice. We know that because he offered this ram up as a burnt offering. That meant that the whole the animal had to be burned to ashes. Our Lord didn't halfway give himself. He just didn't give a little. He gave it all. He gave it all. A total sacrifice. And then last of all, number six. Why this sacrifice of the ram reminds us or is a picture of the sacrifice of our Lord is because this is the greatest of them all. It was, it was a satisfying sacrifice. This sacrifice that Abraham prepared for his God was a ram. And the reason that God is now speaking the second time to Abraham is not only because he obeyed, and we're going to see that, but also because he pleased his God. I'm glad, thank God, that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was a satisfying sacrifice to God. Amen? It satisfied our God. It satisfied our God. It brought sinners to be able to walk in fellowship once again with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wonderful. We could stop there and shout a while. What a wonderful... None of this came from a book. This comes from God to my heart tonight, and I'm thrilled about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Verse 16. Now, the sacrifice is over. There's nothing but ashes and the smell there of the, the burnt ashes. The Bible says the angel called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time, verse 16, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Notice there were two things in verse 16 that the Lord said was the reason for what God's about to say to Abraham. He said, first of all, because thou hast done this thing, what thing? The sacrifice, the burnt offering of the ram. And number two, and... Conjunction, and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son. The Lord is, is telling Abraham, he said, because you have obeyed me, either you want to say it one or two ways here, they both are talking about obedience to God. I believe that Abraham learned something here that later on the prophet Samuel would speak to King Saul. And you and I, we've heard this said before, and Abraham learned it before Samuel was ever in this world. And you remember when Saul had went out and he had fought against his enemies and he was told to utterly destroy them all. And you understand that 
Uh, King Agag was spared some of the best sheep, the best animals. And how Samuel came to King Saul and said, Saul, did you obey God? Did you do what God told you to do? And Saul does sometimes like we do. He thought that halfway obedience would be good enough. Maybe not do everything God's asked us to do, but do part of it. Do the part that is easiest. Amen. Do the part that's more convenient. Saul said, Oh yeah, I've obeyed the Lord. I did what He told me to do. And about that time, that, that. It's funny how God will let you know in a hurry you'll reap what you sow and be sure your sins find you out. What That had to be one of the most embarrassing times in the life of Saul to stand there before the preacher and to tell the preacher, I've done what God told me to do. I've utterly destroyed. And before he got the word destroyed out, that, that, I wonder what Saul's facial expression must have been. I don't know if he could have been more red in the face than he was at that time. And Samuel said, what is the bleeding of the sheep that I hear? And then he had to confess, well, I did this because I wanted to come back and make sacrifices unto God. Samuel looked at King Saul, inspired of God, and he said it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Is that not what happens right here? God is telling Abraham it's better to obey than sacrifice. Thank God for that. Abraham didn't have to sacrifice, did he? But he had to obey. He had to obey. I'm glad God will never contradict himself. Amen? That is wonderful thought tonight. Now, God is talking to Abraham and he begins to say that I'm going to swear by myself. You know why he did that, don't you? Because I believe it's Hebrew says that there's no one greater that he could have sworn by but himself. Amen? If he had sworn by President Abomination, it, it, it had to, you know, it's not good enough. If he had sweared by our government, if he had sweared by you and I, but he swore by himself. No one greater. And it says that I'm going to bless thee and I'm going to multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. God's word to Abraham, God's promise to Abraham has not changed. I'm going to read, and and if you want to, you can flip with me, but I want to read to you what God had said years and years before chapter 22 to Abraham. And chapter 12, excuse me, verse 1, The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse them that curseth thee. And then these shall all families of the earth be blessed. Does that sound about like what we just read in chapter 22? Chapter number 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, After the lot was separated from here, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Verse 16, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Does that not sound like what the Lord said in chapter 22? Chapter 15, verse 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision and said, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy seed in great reward. And when you drop down, drop down to verse number 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, talking of Ishmael, for he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels, Isaac, shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. 
Is that not what God is saying in chapter 22? Go to chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse number 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thy perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. In chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 15, chapter 17, and in chapter 22, if you'll compare those words of God to Abraham... They all are the same because God's Word never changes. A lot of things, note this, a lot of things has changed in the life of Abraham through the years. He has went through a time where it was just him and Sarah. He has went through the time where it was a famine and he went down to Egypt and he lied about Sarah. He has went through the time where he, Sarah had the idea of Abraham ought to just have a son or a child through their the handmaid, Hagar, and they've had Ishmael. Things have changed through the years. We know that that circumcision has come. We know that Isaac's been born. We know that he's had his conversation and dealings with Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. We know that Abraham and Sarah has been through the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the time they also had to say farewell to Lot. A lot of things has changed in Abraham's life by the time you get to chapter 22. But one thing has not changed in the life of Abraham, and that is God's Word. And we need to understand that tonight because a lot of folks don't understand that. They feel that if things around them changes and if society changes, and if fashion changes, then the church ought to change. The Word of God ought to be changed. The preacher, he's got to change on some issues. But the Word of God will never, ever change. Because the Bible says it's forever settled in heaven. Amen. You know, I love you. I love you with all my heart. I've proven that, and I'll continue to prove that by the help of Almighty God. But one thing that, by the help of God, I will not be accused of is that I've tried to change the Word of God. Or I've tried to change so that I can get more people coming to this church. Or that I've tried to change so I can keep you here. Or that I can have a bigger congregation, therefore with a bigger salary. By the help of God, His Word does not change. If years and years ago God said it was sin, it's still sin today. The Word of God has not changed. Why? Why has God promised not changed to Abraham? Because the one that made the promise is faithful. The promise has not changed. Listen, a lot of things have changed in my life since I first got saved in 1996. A lot of things have been changing since 1998 of May when I answered the call to the ministry. A lot of things have changed in my life. A lot of things. But He has not changed. His Word has not changed. And His promises, they will not change. He will remain faithful to us. Amen. No matter the report from the doctor, no matter what the bank account looks like, no matter what our economy may go through, no matter who is our president, no matter who sits in Congress, our God and His Word and His promises will not change. They will remain faithful. Hallelujah. Verse 19. Says, 
So Abraham returned unto his young men. You remember he left those down there, kind of the base of the mountain there. You know, him and Isaac went farther up. You remember that? So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now, you remember Beersheba, I hope, in the previous chapter. Abraham has an encounter with Abimelech. This is his second encounter. The first encounter was when Abimelech liked the way Sarah looked, and being a king, he decided he would take her and marry her because Abraham had lied. He said, this is my sister. He lied to Pharaoh of Egypt, and now he's lied to the king of the Philistines. Sarah's got to start wondering why in the devil was he telling everybody I'm his sister, not his wife. Amen. Wouldn't that worry you ladies? <laughs> oh, and so... Uh, he's second encounter in chapter 21. The Bible tells us that uh, they had an oath there between one another, and Abimelech said, "If you'll if, if you'll be my friend, so to speak, we'll we'll have a covenant one with another." And Abraham said, "Well, what about that well that I dug down there that your your servants have stole from me?" And Abimelech said, I didn't know nothing about that. I, I wasn't behind that, but I'll fix it. So Abraham said, okay, we'll have a covenant. You know the covenant in chapter 21, the latter part. And he dug a well, and the Bible says that he called that region Beersheba. Beersheba. That's verse 32. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. And Abimelech rose up, and Phicol, the chief captain of the host, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. The word Beersheba means the well of oath. The well of oath. So Abraham is going back to Beersheba. Now let's get to verse number 20. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milka, it's pronounced M I L slash or dash K A H. C, there is a K sounding, Milcah, uh, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor. You remember, Abraham had two brothers, Nahor and, who's the second one? Anybody know? Haran. Haran, the youngest of the three, or Haran, whatever, this, either way, but a Haran or Haran. And so Nahor, his brother, has now got eight children from through his wife, Milka. Now, verse 21 and 22, we read the names earlier of these eight children. Now, we know that Milka, in verse 20, uh, was the daughter of Haran, Abraham's youngest brother. You remember Haran died. Haran died. And so Nahor married his brother's daughter, Milka. And so Milka has eight children. And the reason we have this is not only for a historical standpoint, but also for the next chapter. Because the latter part of 22, the last name that is mentioned is Bethel. Bethel. And Bethel, in verse 23, has a daughter by the name of Rebekah. And in chapter 23... So forth, we're going to see that this is the same Rebekah that marries Abraham's son, Isaac. So it's there for historical standpoint. Also, uh, it's there for importance for the next following chapters when we start looking at the life of Isaac after the death of Abraham. Now, this is interesting, and, and I may have to close here, but this is interesting to me. Some of you... Uh, are intrigued by this study, and you like these extra little nuggets. But Nahor and Milcah had eight children. In verse number 24, Nahor had a concubine who had four children. So eight and four is twelve, right? Now Nahor's uh, descendants here uh, with twelve is going to be the ancestors of the twelve Syrian tribes, okay? 
the twelve Syrian tribes. Ishmael, as we read earlier, God told Abraham that Ishmael would be the father of how many princes? Twelve. Ishmael had twelve uh, uh, princes, and they were the ancestors of the Arabians. Okay, so you have the Syrians, the twelve tribes of the Syrians, through Nahor. Uh, he's a father of these twelve. And then you got Ishmael, who had twelve, who were the ancestors, or the, uh, not the descendants, I should have said, but should be the forefathers of the Arabians, or the Arabs. Well, you know, Abraham... He had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had how many children? How many boys? Twelve. And they were the forefathers of who? Israel. The twelve tribes of the, or the Jews. So you have the Syrians, you have the Arabians, the Arabs, and then you have the Jews. Twelve, twelve, and twelve. Now, in chapter 23, is a sad Sad story here because we see the, the death of Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and she was 127 years old. I thought it was interesting. Can I remind you that when she was, was it 90 years old? What did she say at 90 years old when the angels said, you remember the two angels, the three angels that came, one was the Lord, two was and they came to the tent door, Abraham was there in the heat of the day. And what did they say about Sarah? She was going to do what? She was going to have a baby. And what did she say? I'm too old. She said she was too old at 90, but yet she lived 27 more years. No, 37 more years. I can't subtract, uh, add, can I? She lived 37 more years, but at 90 she said, I'm too old. Listen to me. Only God knows our true potential. You understand that tonight? That's a blessing to me. Satan will tell you you're no good. You can't do any more than what you're doing, and you'll never be a, a better Sunday school teacher, a better pastor, a better this, a better singer, a better this, a better witness, whatever it may be. But God knows your true potential. And with Jesus Christ... We've got a lot of potential, right? We do, we do. And God knew the potential in Sarah. And when Sarah thought she was old and had one foot in the grave, God was laughing at her, says Sarah. You've got 37 more years, honey. You better get used to this being old. Amen. <laughs> Some of us feel old. You might better get used to it. You might live to be 100. Amen. Amen. <laughs> But Sarah was 127 years old, and Sarah died. And, of course, it's the land of Hebron. It later was called Hebron after, the, uh, after Joshua captured the land, the land of Canaan. Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. I don't understand this philosophy that you ought not weep as a Christian over the loss of a beloved one. I've said this before. You may know what I'm going to say. I don't understand when folks don't weep. It makes me feel, and I don't know everything. I know that. But I get the assumption that either, number one, they didn't love that person like they should, or number two, their heart is just hard as a rock. Or they own so much medicine they can't have any emotions anyway. But I thought about that. Abraham, a man of God, wept. He mourned over Sarah. You know, my wife's at home tonight with Matthew, and she was already ready. She came over here, and, and I miss her sitting over there. It, it, I, I tell you, I miss her. I tell her, I said, Honey, I, it's hard for me to teach or preach when you're not. I just the look at your face and when you smile, and I said, It just helps me. But... My wife is like me. We, we just got problems. I'm not perfect, and she's not perfect. Now, you may be perfect, okay? You know, you, we, when we dated, we were perfect. When we got married, we found out we had a lot of imperfections, right? Right? And so, but you know what? I love my wife, 
And and if God was to... And sometimes, you can call her up tonight if you want to. Don't bother me. I, I tell her what I'm teaching. Sometimes her imperfections gets on my nerves. This... I ain't going to ask you. I ain't going to ask you. You're supposed to leave here encouraged. But some of her, and my imperfections sometimes get on. Not, not, we accept those things, but just sometimes it just hits us wrong. And I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. But I know in my heart that I'd be in a mess without her. I know that she's my right arm. And Abraham loved Sarah. Sarah had a lot of imperfections, didn't she? I mean, come on, amen that. She laughed at God. Would that be an imperfection? God said this is going to happen. She went, <laughs> In other words, you're crazy. And she was a, just an imperfect lady. But you know what Abraham knew that we men need to know? Abraham knew that she may be imperfect, but she's mine. She's mine. Wives, your husband's imperfect. He's imperfect. But he's yours. And you ought to love each other. You ought to care for each other. Because I believe that if I don't love my wife, that there'll be somebody out there that will. I believe that. You've got you to you love each other, okay? You're not going to understand each other. And, and I'm not going to get on marriage tonight. I just thought, I didn't have that in my notes. I just saw it. He loved her. He loved her. And he loved her so much that he wanted to have a, the perfect place to bury her. Not any place would do, a perfect place. And we know the story how that he went and he purchased some land here from Ephraim. And he speaks to Heath, or Eth, the this guy is the forefather of the Hittites. And through this, he meets Ephraim, and he says, I, I want this cave. Over in that land, in the field of trees, the word you see there, uh, the word in verse 2, uh, Kerjatherba, the word K-I-R means forest. And you'll see later in this chapter that there was trees in this where this cave was, so it was a forest-type land. And Abraham buys this. And the person wants to give it to him. Ephraim wants to give it away. And I, I, uh, I want to get in chapter 24 next Wednesday, so I'm just going to give you the cliff notes and go home. He wants to give it to him. He said, Abraham, you, you're a mighty man. You're a great man. I want to give it to you. I mean, he's going to give it to him, the land. And Abraham said he appreciated it. But Abraham said, it's not right for me to be wealthy as God has made me. To have the gold and silver that I do and me not give you money for that land. I, I think that's good. What a just man Abraham was. Abraham could have said, as some of us have, if it's free, it's for me. You, Thank you, I'll take it. I mean, sometimes you don't need to take everything that's free. You know, you, sometimes you need to think about it and say, you know, it, I want to bless this person. You may not give them what it's worth, but if they say, I want you to have, you can still do something for them. You can take them out to eat. You can do something for them. And Abraham said, no. He said, I, I appreciate your love for me and your kindness. I appreciate you honoring me, but God's blessed me and I, I would be a fool. It would be unjust for me to take something from you. Abraham's not arrogant. He's not saying, I got more than you got. and I can't take this. No, he's just saying, hey, God's been good to me. I'm, and so they work a deal out. And Ephraim made a great statement in that chapter. He said, what is it to, between us? He said, come on, Abraham. We're so close and I love you so much. What wonderful. Ephraim, I, I've never heard a message on Ephraim, but I, I think it would be a good time for me to study about Ephraim. Ephraim said, what is it to us? Abraham said, I'm going to pay for it. Whatever it is. And Ephraim said, it don't mean that much when it comes to our relationship. Isn't that great? Oh, you and I had a, the same idea Ephraim had about his relationship with Abraham that we would have it with our Lord. Lord, I know you want me to do this. That's nothing to me, Lord. Not what you mean to me. I'll do it. <laughs> Some of you here sick. Linda mentioned being sick. 
You know, that's a blessing to me. There's so many people home tonight with a stump toe, got a little little frog in their throat. They, they find any reason to stay home. But I tell you what, he, he, if I can get here and if I can serve the Lord, his relationship with me is so valuable. It is so wonderful that, that by the help of God, if I can do it, I'll say, Lord, whatever you have me to do, I'll do because I can't even tell you how I feel about you. Wonderful. Ephraim's a wonderful, wonderful Bible character. But I thought it's ironic tonight that at the end of this chapter, Abraham buys the land. He goes and he buries his wife, Sarah, in this cave. And although that God told Abraham that you'll possess Canaan, you remember that? Often he said your seed will possess Canaan. Legally, according to man's law, according to man's government, watch this, the only piece of property that Abraham really owned was that burial place. That is the only place, piece of property that he legally owned according to the laws of man was that burial place. I think there's something there. I think it shows us the kind of person Abraham really was. He was a man that God had blessed, but he was a man that had died to this world. He died to the materialistic things of this life. He died to honor and prestige and to riches and fortune and fame. He died to those things so that he might gain Christ, so that he might have more of God. He died to earthly things that he might have heavenly things. He was a man that had died to his flesh. And so it is today the only piece of property that Abraham ever owned legally according to man's law was a grave. The grave of Sarah and eventually his grave. That is wonderful to me. We so often get our mind on temporary things, don't we? Materialistic things. We get our mind on the things that the world's got their mind on and we're supposed to be strangers in this land as Abraham was. We're supposed to be pilgrims in this land. You know what a stranger is? He's not from here. You know what a pilgrim is? Going to his home. We're a stranger. This is not our land. We're aliens. This is not our land. But we're also pilgrims. We're heading to our land. Hebrews tells us that Abraham was looking for a country that was heavenly. My dad used to say, Son, don't drive your stakes too far in this world. And I never did understand that until after I got saved and, and got to studying and reading my Bible and living for the Lord. And it, and it made sense. Lay not treasures up on this earth, but lay them up in heaven. What a beautiful picture of the life of Abraham for God. He said, Lord, I'll die to the things of this life so that I might please you. Praise the Lord for that. I appreciate you being here tonight. You've been kind to me to allow me to get out what was upon my heart. Chapter 22 has took us three or four Wednesday nights, but I don't regret it. The Lord has been so good to us, so kind to us. And so, we'll, Lord, we'll begin chapter 23 next Wednesday night.